Hello, and welcome back to Locusts and Wild Honey, the preaching ministry of Birth of the Baptist Orthodox Church in Pinckney, Michigan. I'm Father Methodius Kvastek, priest and rector of this community. I hope you will find the materials here to be spiritually beneficial. Thank you for joining me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Congratulations to all, and welcome. The readings that we had today, once again, minister to us at a very deep level, and I, I was wondering if we could produce that epistle. I believe it's the first of the two that were read from today. We had a talk last night in, here in the church. I gave an exhortation for us to all push ourselves harder and further, and to show by our actions what our faith is. One of the things that we learn from our prayers, and certainly from the teaching of the fathers, is that we're not worthy of higher honors. This is just something that we see over and again in in the teaching of the church. Whether it's true or not that we are unworthy of higher honors, that should be our disposition. You've all encountered these people who demand that you respect them. Uh, I am uh, I'm encountering uh, an elderly gentleman right now in my life. I won't disclose where, but it's snowy there, and people ski, and he he is a uh, he he's fine, but he's normal, and he because of his age, he thinks that everyone younger than him is required to respect and honor him, but he's he does not conduct himself in a manner that that commands respect. He does not carry himself in a respectful way. He uses harsh language, he's critical of people, and he jokes. And so if you want respect, there's a way to get it. Don't act like a fool, or at least try not to, like I do. I, I try not to act like a fool. This was read in the, in the epistle today, and I, I can't find where precisely it was. We said last night that if we, if we can't even get ourselves to church on time when there's no reason, then we're not providing a contrast to the people in the world and people in world orthodoxy. And we even said in genuine orthodoxy that people, they come to the services at the very end of the service. L- literally, we should understand how the services break down. And we'll see that when most people show up to church, it's the end of the service. And then they have their meal, and they talk about Greek things. And that's really why they're there, most people. Uh, for, for most people, the, the church is limited to a social dynamic. And they go there to, to see their family, and they go there to see their friends and their ethnic uh, counterparts in their communities. And because they treat it that way, they show that they have not tapped into the rich resource that the church is, that has the power to transform them from being people into gods by grace. And in the church, we do not operate in terms of a meritocracy, especially in the GOC we've seen this. There are organizations that operate that way, that you perform and then you get a reward and a promotion. And then everybody knows by the size of the cross that you wear or by the color of hat that you wear Everybody knows that you've done a good boy, right? And it's really disgusting. And you start to feel like it. You start to feel like I's a good boy. And that's, that is how it is. And it's, it's shameful. It's shameful because this is the church. This is the, this is the body of Christ. And when God came to earth, he came as a helpless infant. And then he died crucified on a cross, nailed to the beam with his hands, nailed to the beam with his feet. And we think we're big shots. So we have to focus on the simple, humble things. We have to be able to be reliable, to be dependable. That was the the talk last night, but now I'm putting it into a broader context for you. Because in today's gospel... The Lord encounters a woman after going through the lands of Tyre and Sidon, and Tyre and Sidon were Gentilian realms, primarily. 
he enters into this land where he encounters the Canaanite woman. And can anyone tell me offhand what the word Canaan means? Or people say Canaan. I've talked to Arabic people and they said you should say Canaan. And it doesn't have to do with his elevation. Well, yes, it actually does. It, it does. But um, the word itself means prepared by humility. And this is the woman that we, that we discover today, this hero, this heroic woman that we encounter in the gospel today. I read the gospel yesterday and I read the gospel today and I was astounded by the great faith of this woman And I want to take a moment to talk about how people make an idol of someone they call Jesus. They say that he's God in their lives. They say he's Lord of my life, but he certainly isn't calling the shots. And they certainly are not imitating him. And then you wonder what they could possibly mean by that. And even this week, we heard in the interview that Tucker Carlson gave with Vladimir Putin that he thought he had a a stumper question, and he asked, how do you reconcile being a Christian with with being a world leader who goes to war? And Putin said very easily. And then he didn't actually reconcile the two without dismissing his faith first and spiritualizing it, which is what he did, as much as I have respect for that interview and and appreciated it. Putin basically said, well, my, my religion is in my heart. Well, what comes out of your mouth shows what's in your heart. So I, I don't see how we can have that. You don't keep your faith trapped inside your heart and somehow it, it does you any good. It has to spill out. It has to spill out into the world. Well, people do, the, they do a similar thing with Jesus and they say, I might say something that seems very harsh and very, uh, very uh, firm. And they'll say, oh, Father Methodius, you're not very Christ-like. And I say, what? Where do you get this idea that Christ was some sort of hippie or some sort of peacemonger when he said, for example, how does Tucker Carlson get the idea that our Lord is a peacemonger when he says, think not that I came to bring peace. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And why did Putin miss the opportunity to theologize a little bit instead of spiritualizing? And how do people... I remember having a discussion with this uh, priest. He was from the OCA. He transferred to Rokor when the OCA was sick of him. And and now he's just been bouncing around Rokor and throwing weights around and listening to death metal music, as his internet reels seem to indicate. He's all tattooed. He's a priest of the church. He's covered with tattoos. He does deadlifting, listening to death metal music. And says that parents should send their children to Halloween parties at Protestant churches so that they can dress up. It's all about making memories, he says. This is just shameful. This is more just as this is this is a reproach to the church. This kind of teaching is irresponsible. But this priest told me that I wasn't very Christ like because I speak with uh, firmness sometimes. But you hear in today's gospel that this woman is crying out with piety, with faith and doing everything that she should do to attract his merciful attention. And the Lord ignores her. Did you pick? Did you hear that from the text? He ignores her. He ignores her and just keeps walking. And she has a real concern. Her daughter is possessed of demons. And she believes in her heart that he can do something about it. And so she approaches him, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. That shows you so much about her faith. She had love which does not seek its own. She had sympathy so profoundly that the suffering of her daughter was her own suffering. She didn't say, heal my daughter. She said, have mercy on me. This is something that we should pay attention to. Because we all call ourselves Christians and we're all offended by other people's uh, shortcomings. And if we're offended by other people's shortcomings, we are a million miles away from absorbing their pain and making it our own. And this is what she does. And yet he just leaves her. And then the disciples, 
we hear it kind of as a uh, dismissive statement on their part. They say, Lord, send her away. But according to certain holy fathers, they are not trying to dismiss things and, and just have the Lord send her away. They think that it's wrong for the Lord to ignore her. And so they're giving him another opportunity, they think, to realize her need. Basically, what they're saying is, Lord, could you please do something about this woman? She's drawing all kinds of negative press toward us. And then finally, the Lord, who knows the hearts of men, calls this woman a dog in her suffering and in her pain. He says, I'm not going to give you food. I'm not going to give you the food of the children. It's not right to give it to dogs. Where's the hallmark Jesus? Why isn't he? Why didn't he show up here? Why didn't he say, "Oh, oh, oh"? You know what? Your life is so. I'm. I feel so sorry for you. Let me make it better. He didn't do that. That wasn't the approach that he took. He he ignored her first, and then when her cries didn't reach him. Then the, the disciples called his attention to it. And then finally, when he does react to her, he calls her a dog. And we should all be mortified. We should say, how could he do such a thing? And this is when we have to remember everything else that we know about the faith, about the scriptures, about the Lord, about how he deals with people. And you remember, the, you remember Job, the story of Job that we have in the scriptures, and the devil comes to the Lord and he says, you know, he, he tempts the Lord and he says, hey, look, have, you, have you paid attention to this guy, Job? Everyone thinks he's such a pious guy and he loves you and everything, but that's because all you do is give him everything. And if you, if you were to let me take it away from him, you would see what he's made of. And the Lord said, go for it and you will see. And he confounds the devil through much suffering. That's why we call him Job the much suffering. Through his suffering love for the Lord, through his faith, his steadfast faith in the God who is, not the God who gives me everything that I want, the God who is and the God that precedes my perceived needs and my desires, the God who created me so that I could enjoy him, the God who created me so that he could reveal himself to me. That's the God Job had faith in. And we see now that this is also the God that this woman had faith in. And she says, you are right. I am a dog. And it is not right for the beast to eat the food that belongs to the children. But even the beast eats crumbs that fall from the master's table. He has, he has ignored her. He has debased her. And her faith is unshaken. Do you see this? This is what's going on in this gospel story. And I'm, I'm afraid that we kind of miss it. And it's proof that we miss it is that everybody thinks that Jesus is nice and about being nice. And everybody thinks further that the saints are nice people. And that's why in world orthodoxy and in many of the uh, confessions, they think of saints as nice people. And in the world orthodox churches, we were, Matushka, we were just talking about this. Um, uh, what was it that we listened to? Oh, maybe it wasn't Matushka and I. Conrad Franz and Dmitry Kalyagin. They were recently talking about all of these all of these candidates for sainthood in world orthodoxy and they were just naming people and there was no there was no theological basis for this list that they gave. I don't know if you heard that one. On uh, I can't remember what the it was on um Sar Paul. Oh yeah, I did hear that. Yeah. Okay, so you heard that that dialogue that they were having about these candidates for sainthood. But they gave no theological basis for it. And it's not just people who did good things. And it's not just people who are nice. As you see, it's people who are prepared by humility. The woman of Canaan. This is why we have this story. We won't take criticism from God 
And proof is that we, it, we find it very difficult to take criticism from man. It would be easier for us to be criticized by man who we do see and who knows how we live and who knows what we've said and what we've done to prepare us to be judged by God. We'll have no answer. And you see this in this woman. She gives no answer. She agrees with everything that he says. She isn't even indignant that he ignores her at first. She just keeps crying out, have mercy on me. And then he says, such great faith, such great faith. And this is the kind of faith that I want us to be cultivating. I want us to be people who are impervious to insults. I want us to have invincible faith, the kind of faith that can be uh, mocked, the kind of faith that can be persecuted, the kind of faith ultimately that can suffer death. We're, we're, like I said, we're a million miles away from that. But that's the kind of faith that is possible for us. And that is the kind of faith that Christ died to impart to us. Do you see it? We have to start with the small things. We have to prepare ourselves in humility. That's, that's, why, I gave that, that's why I gave that definition of that word. We have to be being prepared in humility. And then we start to love humility. We start to love humility having the lesser lot. Or we are invited to a feast and we take the lowest table. Now, I'm kind of learning that in, at the clergy table. We don't have a clergy table here in this parish, which is nice because I feel like the clergy should be with the people. But when you go to other parishes, they have the clergy table. And I'm always, you'll notice this if you ever come, Father Methodius is always over there on the one end. I love it there. Because I'm the first one, I get to talk to the people. They come to the table and I'm the first one they, they, they run into. But I, I used to think, am I supposed to sit next to the bishop? And then I sat next to the bishop, and he said, no, you have to go down there. And then I got used to that. Okay, I'm at the, I'm at the far end of the table. And it's perfect. It's perfect for me. I have no business being up there with him. What I am is I'm one of the people. I'm just the president of the people. That's all. That's the difference. I'm, I preside over the people in the divine liturgy. We have to start to love our lesser lot in life. And we will, we will know that we're on that path if we stop aspiring for great things according to the world's definition. We talked about this even, even this week. We had a conversation about this kind of thing. I wasn't even thinking about that, and then it just hit me. We did, we did have this conversation. We will start to see healing in ourselves. We'll start to be able to know that we are being healed to a certain degree when the things that we are attached to in our former lives have nothing within us to hold on to. They can take no grip in us. This woman is a, such a sterling example for us in her faith. She followed the Lord. What is this? Even though he may slay me. Right? Who said that? Was that Abraham? Was that was someone from the scriptures of old? Maybe it was David. Yeah. Maybe it was, I don't know. We'll, we'll find, someone tell me that. Someone, someone discover that and tell me. I will love the Lord even though he ignores me and even though he calls me a dog, this woman said. Right? She had everything that we need. This is the gospel for today. We should meditate upon it and we should be taught by it. We should become people who are humble and people who love humility. Amen. We hope you found these materials to be spiritually beneficial. If you benefit from what you hear and would like to know more about Orthodoxy generally or about genuine Orthodoxy, please don't hesitate to contact me. If you would like to visit us, please check out our website at birthofthebaptistorthodoxchurch.com for the service schedule and contact information. It would be an honor to meet you. Also, keep up with us on Facebook or find me on Instagram at Art of Prayer Workshop, where you can find beautiful, traditional, hand-painted icons, as well as other devotional items for your home chapel or church. If you'd like to support us financially, donations can easily be made through PayPal at fellowheirs at hotmail.com. Please remember us in your prayers.